Tonight's talk is really technical, medical, spiritual, and also just a little doctrine thrown in because you need guidance, but you need to do it before it's a panic period. It's awful coming with a, a room full of people and everyone's voicing different opinions and they've never had the conversation. Typically because American culture, we don't talk about death. We just get younger and younger, better looking, it's incredible. Um, if you make plans for your funeral, those are plans we're going to use. Make plans for other things, maybe I'll use your tickets or maybe I'll use my tickets. Um, but funerals, taxes, those are good plans to make. Uh, but we avoid, we don't avoid the taxes, but we avoid, <laughs> we avoid talking about those things, which is why it's a vital conversation uh, to have. To, to sit there in the month of the Holy Souls to pray for the dead, um, knows that it's something we all go through and can plan for, and it's also something that uh, we'll be responsible for at some point in our life. But, you know, I, I see the problems in probate that happen, my goodness. That's another aspect. I didn't bring a lawyer in tonight, because that, that's a whole that can of works. <laughs> you know, who gets the money, who gets the house, and all of those things. But um, the conversations we have to, and they're not morbid conversations. As Christians, we live a story of hope that continues. It's just, how do we get there? And it's so much more complicated than it was before. Before, like, like John said, gee, you had a heart attack, you died. You know, if, if it had been, my grandmother died in 63, um, I don't know if they could have saved him today, but they probably could have done something, who knows? And it's amazing what they do, so. Mm -hmm. But, uh, go ahead and talk that, no, I'm kidding, no. <laughs> Well, it was funny, actually talking about the um, uh, CPR, mm -hmm. you know, you were saying and whatnot, you see in the uh, in the media, on TV, in these shows, you know, there's always this, this guy passes out, or you know, you pull him out of the swimming pool, and, you know, three or four little things on the chest. The guy wakes up, mysterious, magically, and you know, oh, he's all good and everything. That couldn't be farther from what actually takes place. <laughs> CPR is a very messy thing that's not pleasant at all. Okay, and. The one thing that we actually physicians remind ourselves of sometimes is that people will go into you know an emergent situation as Father was talking about. Someone's heart stopped. These other things have happened. They're not breathing. Then their heart stops. Whatever it may be, um, you remind yourself that when you go in there, if you do anything and help them, that is miraculous because at this point they're pretty much already dead. What you can do is to, to help them and restore their heart function. But if you were to do nothing, they had a natural death. It was just the fact that you happen to be monitoring them in the hospital and then you realize that their heart stopped. Mm -hmm. If that was someone in an armchair at home, they would have just passed in their sleep and that would have been the end of it. Um, the thing with CPR, as Father was kind of getting to with the story you were talking about, is that when, when people want everything done, you have CPR. And this is not to dissuade anyone from this. If this is something that you want done, there's no reason you can't. Mm -hmm. But you go in there, you know, we're breathing for people, but all those things that they show on TV, these little, you know, this, that. If you even feel your rib structure, you'll notice this doesn't go anywhere. Right. Yeah. That this is hard. So when you, it, it's, it's kind of a rule of thumb that people in the hospital say, if you're doing CPR and you don't hear ribs crack, mm -hmm. you're not doing very good CPR. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you really, in order to actually compress the heart, if you think about it, what you're doing is you're trying to make the heart pump, because the heart does this all the time. So what you're trying to do is keep the pump going so that the blood keeps moving around while you're doing all these other interventions. And if you're pushing on something that doesn't move, you can't squeeze the heart very well. So this has to go before the heart starts going. So there's that, there's a lot of trauma from that. In the midst of doing all these interventions, try, you know, heart going, you're doing this, you're doing compressions, you usually place a breathing tube, which is what they usually call us to do because we're the most experienced. You breathe for them and do all these things. It happens a lot of times that even when people are found down in the field, at home, you know, wherever it is, have heart attacks, someone bystander does CPR, this, that, sometimes they'll get the heart back and they'll get the lungs going, but this is already gone. I mean, you, you can't survive but maybe a minute or two at maximum without breathing. That's why it's so easy for people to drown and people to be suffocated. Because without the oxygen, the brain is very sensitive. There's other things, you know, you could hold your finger for, you know, 20, 30 minutes longer, turns blue. 
you will know, let go, it'll come right back, no big deal. Brain is extremely sensitive. So even sometimes when the heart comes back, this doesn't. So this is a very acute, life-saving thing. If you can do it right when it happens and you get back a pulse, you have a decent chance of saving someone. But it's not like you see presented elsewhere. I mean, you have maybe even a 30% chance of resuscitating someone, and that's optimistic. So it's not like, oh, well, they didn't do CPR on my Uncle Milton. They killed him. You know, they didn't do everything they could. Most of the time, it doesn't even work. I mean, I've seen it work. I've seen people come back. But a lot of the times, they'll do CPR for half hour, 45 minutes, keep trying, till eventually nothing's happening. And it's like, we did everything we could. You know, there's, there's nothing more that you can do. And as the physician, you have to be the one to call that situation. So, you know, everybody stop. We're done here. We can't do anymore. So it's, it's not the life-saving measure it seems to be all the time. It's very invasive and a very you know, painful thing to recover from if you're breaking someone's ribs and they recover from it. So it's not like saying that you know, if I don't want CPR done, you know, it's something that could have saved me every time. That's not true. What, yes. what about the electric things? What are they called? The oh, uh, yes, the uh, defibrillator pay. AED. Yes, AEDs. What that is, that's more of an adjunct. There's two different things. You can have it where the heart just stops, and then you're doing your compressions and things like that, or you can have it where the heart's not beating properly. You can imagine, you know, you have a big, big um, heart uh, chamber opening up like this, sucking in blood, and then compressing itself and pushing all that blood out. Well, if somehow the electrical system gets confused, you start having the walls of the heart going like, jiggling all over the place, blood's not going to anywhere it needs to, and the patient collapses and passes out because the brain's not getting any more oxygen. In that case, you do your compressions to get it going, but in order to restart that electrical system, you need to do the shocking with the pads in order to do that. So there's specific circumstances where it's used and circumstances where it's not used. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Sorry, did someone else have their hand up? I thought that I... Uh... Okay. When we have um, people do um, a healthcare proxy, or a, they'll have a DNR, do not resuscitate, um, a medical advanced medical directive. Uh, there's guidelines provided by the National Catholic Bioethics Center, and they're strict. But at the same time, if someone ends up in a persistent vegetative state, then all of a sudden, ordinary and extraordinary means start to change. You say, well, we keep this person alive and there's no hope that they'll ever recover. Then you have a, a longer meeting and, and you discern what's the best route to take. And some people will withdraw hydration or withdraw nutrition and let the person uh, pass. Um, but there's, those, are, those are very uh, volatile situations Extreme circumstances. Uh, and uh, unusual, thank, thank goodness. But um, people do lots of things and make lots of mistakes and put themselves in harm's way or don't take care of themselves. You know, they're abusing drugs and then, they, then they're drunk and then, they're, and then they get in a car accident, major brain trauma, and all these complicated things. But these, these things, you know, they do happen. Um, we also do um, preparation of, for, for anybody pre-need. The first week I was ordaining a letter from the Archbishop. I thought, this is great. I'm getting promoted. I'm going to be my senior. This is perfect. And was dear father, Reverend and dear father, which was nice, but it was cool. Please make your funeral plans. And close, fill out this form. Like, oh my, I'm dying already. I'm not even a priest a week. But it's it's very good to make your plans. That's something that you need, because as Christians, we we uh, we have the hope of eternal life. We have that, but we're also the stewards of the of the temple, of the Holy Spirit. Let's take good care of this. You know, when you visit in the hospital, someone says, "Why is God doing this to me?" Like, did did God give you all the junk food that you? What do you, you know, how are you taking care of, how are you the steward of that? There's lots of um, conditions that people inherit. Um, I, I often <laughs> hear people say, thanks, mom, you know, they got this condition or that condition. But uh, what, do you, what do you do with that? Um, I think you know, prepare for lots of things. And to have the difficult conversations, um, avoid strange situations later on where people don't know their wishes or desires. Many times I've been with people that I said, well, what, what did your you know, uh, relative say? We never talked about it. 
said, okay, so you've known each other for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, it never came, never came up, okay, all right. And people will, they'll avoid it, it happens all the time. But the, the, it's easier on the family that, well, these are their wishes. Occasionally, and then you can also head up the bizarre wishes where it's like, what are you thinking? You know, they get really strange requests sometimes. But you want to honor those wishes, and uh, if you think with the mind of the church, the church calls herself an expert in humanity, and, and she's right. And she'll, she's been to most of these situations before and knows what to do and can act as a guide for those situations. My healthcare proxy is, a, is another priest friend of mine who's five years younger, and he runs all the time. <laughs> and I want to save my family the, the tribulation of going to those, making those, those decisions. It is also my, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, a state guy, um, the executor, and they can fight over my millions. But, but you, you, you really need to be, have a, a, a very sober conversation about things. And it's not a sad conversation, but rather it's very practical. Um, and, the, and the circumstances that arise in the time of someone's passing, it's an act of kindness towards your family that they don't just say, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. A funeral director will come in and have to go through 200 different steps in order to legally uh, um, deal with the passing of someone. That's a lot, and they have to ask someone in the family about all those 200 steps. And you know, it's like, here, well, this is what, another thing, and more and more and more, and it takes hours and hours and hours to do that. And you can have that all planned ahead of time, that no matter what the circumstances are, then you have the freedom, a level playing field, to grieve. What usually happens with no plans is all those plan, plan making is a distraction from grief, and so it's grief delayed. And instead, the three stations of the Catholic funeral rite are the uh, wake, the mass, and the burial. And that's perfect, and it's, it's genius. It's really ins inspirational, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to bring people through all the different shades of death um, to a place of peace. And a, re a reminder of the Paschal mystery of the, the uh, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we go through our own Good Friday. And these are really kind of Good Friday moments. Um, I had a young man who was 40, 49, was 48 at the time. I thought, gee, he was a major in the state police, a very fine man. I'm standing in the room, and his wife turned to me, and there's a lot of people in the room, and uh, turned to me and said, well, you know, it, it just seems so odd that you're here because, well, you know, your brother was his roommate in college. I did not know that. and. All of humanity comes together, and you never know who you run into with these, these coincidences, which I don't believe, and I think you're there for a reason. And I think you're here tonight for a reason, to make plans not necessarily just for yourselves, but almost to act as evangelists for people in your family and say, no, this is really very good. These are, these are important, pertinent, and adult questions. What are the Catholic, uh, you know, ideas or, or points for advanced directives? You know, are they like published or somewhere you can look at? Them? Yeah, uh, if, you know, I'll take your names and I'll send you copies of them. Um, I have to get them, they're in Philadelphia. I have one copy upstairs, but I meant to get them ahead of time, but you know, there's this parish thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> You weren't doing anything else, were you? No, nothing. Nothing I can think of. <laughs> like ten, ten weddings, it's been, you know, I'm more afraid of brides. One thing I, I definitely add yeah. with that, as far as the family members go, is that I've seen it far too often where nobody had a discussion. You know, nobody had any, any say about anything beforehand. You get into the situation, and they'll have five, six kids, you know, spouse, um, you know, whoever it may be. And it comes down to everybody's arguing, this person says this, that person says that, they wouldn't have wanted that, I want everything done, how could you let him go? How, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And even in the midst of the misery that the patient's having being there on life support, mm. the entire family is having an unbelievable amount of misery. And that's something that I think you as a person, before you become the actual patient, 
want to make sure that my family is not going to be at each other's necks trying to figure out what exactly to do with me if this happens. So it's definitely a good thing to broach this topic ahead of time, just so that this way there's you know, little to no question about what it is that you want done, and also naming that person if it's not automatically your spouse, as you said. If there's somebody that you want um, specifically to legally name that person as the person to make the decisions for you in your stead if there's a gray area in the advance directive. We were called in um, by a uh, judge. He said, Father, could you please come in? We need a, an expert witness. We, so I came as the expert witness. Uh, the family's Catholic, and they're finding out whether or not to discontinue uh, extraordinary means, ordinary means. And um, they brought in, um, two of the family members brought in a, uh, a medical witness, expert medical witness. And I was sitting in the corridor before him, before I went to the judge's chambers, and they wouldn't look at me, wouldn't talk to me. And then the other person, was the other belt, uh, showed up and made their opinions known. <coughs> and to the other side's surprise, they actually had the Catholic opinion, was that there was no reason to continue support for someone who had no, no organ was functioning, uh, nothing, nothing was going with the poor man. And, uh, and the one who said, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm a devout Catholic. I'm sure you are. But the, the church's teaching is that you don't have to extend life unnecessarily. Um, and it can be done with compassion and reverence. And they were shocked. And the medical representative was shocked, too. She said, well, I always heard of these great cases. Well, those cases are because there were no plans ahead of time. And you don't think of people having these horrendous situations, but then they happen. Um, you know, we have the tradition in the church to pray to St. Joseph for a happy death. I think that's a good tradition. Um, my grandmother passed. She had got up, um, dressed herself. She was 93, lived by herself, uh, watched TV mass, and then we found her in the chair. She just died sitting there. Uh, my other grandmother lingered in a nursing home for years and years and years and years. And it was very sad to watch her kind of lose her personality and, and very sad. But at the same time, um, she, they kept her dignity, they preserved her dignity, they saw her all the time. They got her those um, uh, Pepperidge Farm cookies she wanted. If she didn't get those cookies, you know, someone else is going to lose their life. So it, 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 it works out well. Um, I wanted to thank. Dr. LaPorta for coming in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very You're welcome. Who, who would you recommend to, to uh, prepare a, uh, a what do you call an advance? The medical care? Yeah, advance the record. Uh, uh, you have to go, lawyer? Have to go okay. to a lawyer. Go to a lawyer, yeah. yeah. To a lawyer. When I made it my will, I... It's a legal document. Yeah, I, I sat with him, went to the whole thing, it's all contained. Yeah. But then you have to tell someone where it is. <laughs> I've seen it before. They can't they, find it. They, That's yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's good to be organized. Um, I would talk to Mrs. Bridge if I were. She's very organized. Yeah. Really well, I would presume yeah. that uh, the person that you named to be your whatever would, yeah. would know. Make sure they have a copy. Have a copy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Make make a copy. Everyone gets one for Christmas. Yeah. Now they, they 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 need that backup because you know you put those things away. Like where did I put it now? Yeah. Um, but they need that. But the discussion. Yeah. They'll remember the discussion. What's the Catholic view on cremation? Oh, it's right, actually the pamphlets at the exits of the yeah, church. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. But the um, basically it's speeding up the decomposition of the body. So we don't mind if you do it as long as you're not refuting a belief in the resurrection. Uh, the, the directives are to you: the person is cremated, and then the ashes are committed somewhere, meaning they're put into the ground or they're dropped into the ocean in a container. Um, the famous. Um, John John Kennedy, when he died, died at sea, plane crash. They got the body back, they cremated the body, and then brought the uh, cremated the urn out to sea and dropped it in the sea. Um, scattering is not recommended. Lots of people scatter. Uh, we have people, and I've seen it, in, and, I, and the funeral home here knows how, what the church teaches. And they'll sell little lockets with little pieces of ash in, in it. I don't. Could the church does not approve of that, and I find something fairly gruesome and morbid about having little uh, 
Right. Remains around. You said scattering is not recommended, but not it's right. not approved. It's not approved it's not either. Approved. It's not approved. Okay, that's and, uh, and I would say not recommended also because I've never seen it go well. Yeah. Like it's, it blows. Yeah. It blows back at you. You. Uh, I was at one the other day, and uh, the funeral director said, "Well, then, Father, then you take the ashes in your hand, put them in the grave." I'm like, "No, I don't." <laughs> You know, so we, we, it, says, it, it was a committal at, it wasn't a Catholic cemetery, so they do it differently. They place the ash, they pour them into a hole in the ground. And like, it was really kind of a tour. Catholic cemetery, you put them in a container, in a vault, mm -hmm. in a place. Um, the idea is to keep everything together. And it seems really odd because one of the tragic things at 9 11, I just went to the museum two weeks ago, where there were people that didn't have a body to mourn. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you go down there, between the two footprints of the towers that stood is the um, a, um, a columbarium, is the container for the end. All the remains that they found that weren't identified because of the high temperatures destroyed the DNA are held by the, the city of New York's morgue in the back. It's a beautiful tomb, uh, but there's a place where they're contained. They're not just, they're, it, yeah. it just, it doesn't mm -hmm. kind of really make sense. It does, theologically, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, and also, the, the, the best thing I've seen is that people will take, um, bring the body to church and then have the cremation. The rites are built around the body. We can do it with cremains in the church, and that's fine. We have a beautiful table with settings for pictures and all this, and very dignified. But it makes more sense of the body. People have to see when the last time they saw you, you're this tall, and now they're this. It doesn't really work. Yeah. And what I find is when people that don't have a view, at least for the family, what happens is we're not ready to bury mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. It takes them two years to go through an acceptance, whereas you, it, as difficult it is to go in and see somebody who's died, and I've seen it for many relatives, it's, it's awful. I didn't have to go through a therapeutic process to go through, okay, I saw them, they're dead. People need to see that, that, that confirmation. Closure. But they do, they need yeah. closure. Yes. Yeah. Um, the Catholic rights work very well, um, and, and we, we try to be as accommodating as possible, and it's but not... you need a burial place. You do. You need a place to visit. So I don't go to visit because they're not there, they're in heaven. Most people go visit at some point. Mentally, you need to. Yeah, you do. You need, uh, you need somewhere to go. You want some, some monument. Um, but I can't tell you the number of funerals that we, we have where people, they're not ready to bury them. Um, and some people have no intention to bury them, or they're waiting for the other person to die, the friend, the spouse, whoever it might be. Uh, my uncle was uh, cremated afterwards, after the funeral, and was buried uh, with his mother, which was very nice. Which is, you know, um, so there's there's that. That people try sometimes they're being frugal and want to save money, but it's the way market things work is that the price of cremation goes up. The worst thing probably is to do without a funeral home. We have people that do direct cremation, they'll pick up the body, cremate it, and they drop off the bodies delivered by some courier service, which is awful. So could you sign for this?